Hello, I'm Seamus Brokaw, an application engineer at Tektronix. Today I want to give you an updated look at switching loss measurements on the Tektronix 5 Series MSO using our new TICP series, IsoView Isolated Current Probes. I'm going to perform a double pulse test on the high side of a silicon carbide half bridge circuit at 400 volts and about 7 amps. Rail voltage is supplied by this electro-automatic high voltage power supply and AFG provides gate stimulus and a 12 volt supply powers the gate driver. For probes, I am using a high voltage differential probe for drain to source voltage, an ISOVIEW voltage probe for high side VGS, a current clamp to monitor the inductor current, and our new ISOVIEW current probe for high side source current. This is a fast, modern, wide band gap silicon carbide board. Operating at 400 volts, we can expect to see slew rates in excess of 50 volts per nanosecond. That means your edge will be less than 8 nanoseconds. And how much bandwidth do you need to measure an 8 nanosecond edge? One rule of thumb is to approximate the bandwidth using a first order filter. Bandwidth equals 0 0.35 divided by 8 nanoseconds, which equals 43.8 megahertz of bandwidth in the edge itself. Now to measure an edge, you want to have at least four or five times the bandwidth in your measurement system as is present in the edge. So this board requires at least 200 to 250 megahertz of bandwidth from our probes and oscilloscope. One last note on probes. The isolated current probe comes with a clamp on common mode choke, a ferrite. This is standard with every TICP, and we find that putting several turns of the probe cable through this common mode choke greatly reduces ringing and common mode artifacts in the signal. All of my current measurements today will be performed using shunt resistors. This is the best known method for making current measurements because the added parasitic inductance is minimized. Wide band gap devices are extremely sensitive to any sort of added inductance in the current path. And shunts, whether surface mount or coaxial, like this one, offer the absolute lowest added insertion inductance. In the past, it was common to use a current transformer or a clamp-on current probe. But both of those methods add too much inductance into the current path and are no longer recommended. Before we energize, please remember, these are absolutely lethal voltages and currents. Evaluate your own risk and mitigate it with an enclosure and personal protective equipment. Energy loss measurements work by multiplying the voltage across and the current through a FET to measure power. The power is then integrated to find the energy. Since two separate probes are used to measure those parameters, it is absolutely critical to accurately time align the measurements. That means we must de-skew the setup. I'll use the special purpose de-skew built into the wide band gap double pulse test application software. First, take an initial measurement. The DSKU control is found in the WBG DPT measurement like EON, so let me add that. Open up the EON measurement and find wide band gap DSKU here. This feature is pretty clever. It's simple Kirchhoff's voltage law performed during the turn on phase. Shunt resistance and rail voltage are known. And the only unknown is this middle term, the effective inductance. We can find this through guess and check. Now 
The DSKU generates a mathematical model of VDS that we compare with our real-world VDS by overlapping them and setting the vertical scales equivalent. The mathematical model is falling too quickly, which means the effective inductance is too high in the model. I'll lower that and try again. That looks much better. Wideband gap DSKU calculated a skew of negative 920 picoseconds for VDS relative to the drain current. Now that the system is DSKUed, we can accurately do the switching loss measurements. And I'm going to start with E on. The software will automatically configure the start and stop thresholds based on JEDEC standards. But what I found is that with ringing measurements, the results are more accurate if you manually set the 10% thresholds based on our known rail voltage and inductor current. Based on the JEDEC standards, the turn on energy starts at 10% of the load current and ends at 10% of the rail voltage. With a 7.2 amp load current, I need 720 milliamps as our 10% threshold. And our rail voltage is 400 volts, so 10% is 40 volts. Next, we can look at turn off energy, E off. Configure E off similarly by manually setting the 10% levels, and we get a result. E on and E off together gives the total switching losses of our system for one cycle. The turn off energy is slightly less than the turn on energy, and that is what we would expect. If you add these two values together and multiply by the switching frequency, you'll get the total switching losses per second that you need to then handle with thermal management. In this example, there's 97 microjoules total. Say we're switching at 40 kilohertz, that means you will have 3.9 watts of heat to dissipate from switching losses. Now that we have this measurement, there's a few other interesting parameters to look at. One is DIDT. DIDT is how quickly the load current is changing during turn on. Quickly using the cursors, I can go to the steepest part of the current waveform. The cursor readout shows me 2.3 gigaamps per second. Typically, we measure these parameters in amps per nanosecond. So that is equivalent to 2.3 amps per nanosecond. DIDT can be seen accurately for the first time, thanks to the ISOVIEW current probe. This parameter is key with motor drive applications. If you have DIDTs that are too large, you can saturate the motor core and reduce efficiency. Another parameter every silicon carbide designer is interested in is the peak drain voltage seen by the FETs. So if we scroll over here to the turn off pulse, what we're looking for is the overshoot on the drain voltage before it settles back to the rail voltage. Add a max measurement on channel two and gate it to the screen. The maximum voltage experienced by this FET is 442 volts. This is an 800 volt rated MOSFET and most designers like to maintain a 200 volt margin below 800 volts. Using the oscilloscope, we can monitor to ensure the FETs never exceed 600 volts during turn off. The final parameter to look at in this double pulse test is DVDT of the upper FET. So again, using the cursors, 15 gigavolts per second. In the industry, we say volts per nanosecond, which is 15 volts per nanosecond. Wide band gap devices like this can see slew rates up to 100 volts or even 220 volts per nanosecond. So that's all for the switching parameters. 
Next, I want to show some reverse recovery measurements. I'm going to double check everything's off before proceeding. To perform reverse recovery measurements, we just have to move the inductor to the top FET and move the gate drive input to the lower FET. It also helps to measure low side BGS, which I'm doing with the TPP1000 10x passive probe. Let me enable the power supplies and trigger the system. Configure QRR measurement through the same wideband gap double pulse test package as before. The QRR measurement shows 256 nanocoulombs. QRR is another measurement that is useful to monitor, especially over temperature. QRR is measured by integrating the current through the body diode during turn off. As this value changes over temperature, it will affect the carefully tuned DVDTs and peak drain voltages from earlier. For reliable performance, the circuit needs to maintain its margins and operate consistently over its temperature range. TRR is another built-in measurement of the software. If QRR is the total charge dissipated during turnoff, then TRR is the corresponding time required to discharge. This handy plot annotates the TA, TB, and total TRR time. Together with our mixed signal oscilloscopes and double pulse test software, our new ISOVIEW Current Probe and ISOVIEW Voltage Probe deliver fast, reliable, low noise measurements in your wide band gap power converter designs, helping you meet deadlines and exceed performance specs.